Okay. Hi everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Gretel Adams from Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. Um, we are in Columbus, Ohio. For those of us that, d that don't know me. Um, we have flowers typically through Thanksgiving, so we're standing in a heated house right now um, where our moms are and there's some cabbage behind me too. Um, yeah, so we're here for an Ask the Farmer. The green the class that we teach is about growing in hoops and greenhouses, which is why I'm standing in the greenhouse. But if you have any questions about other, other farm-related things, we're doing a lot of digging tubers right now. Um, about to transition to like sticks and dried flower wreaths. Um, yeah, so it's kind of an in-between time of year, but uh, waiting on these mums to come on. They're a little late this year, but we're hoping that they'll take us into Thanksgiving. Sometimes if it's warm, they're ready like beginning of November and we don't end up having as much for Thanksgiving. So it's been a cold fall. We had an early frost. Um, and so we've been digging tubers. We're almost done. We got all them dug yesterday, but we still have some to like clean and pick up and things like that. So um, were there questions on there? Or I can start. Okay. So um, our class is talking about growing in hoops and greenhouses. This is both heated and unheated space. Um, for us, it, it helps extend our season so that we have flowers from March through about Thanksgiving. So through the winter, things are growing in the houses. But since we're so gray and cloudy, uh, we don't really have anything blooming like January, December, January, February. Um, last year we did have some stock that was supposed to be for Thanksgiving that was late that ended up blooming in December. Um, so there, we do have a few things. We did use to grow symphonium orchids, which were just kind of a passion project that we got from a farmer who was retiring, um, and those would bloom in January, but we just recently got rid of those because they weren't profitable. So a lot of what we talk about in the class, you know, is just making sure that you're utilizing that greenhouse space. Um, for the most profitable crops. So there's one week talking about um, the actual structures and choosing what kind works for you. Um, week two is about like pricing and enterprise budgets and crop planning to just make sure that you're getting that highest profit per square foot since it is expensive real estate in the greenhouses. And then we talk about spring crops, which is what everybody wants to learn about, the ranunculus, anemones, stalks, snaps, um, then we talk about summer and fall crops like Lizzie's, mums, cabbage, all the things that we grow to kind of get us through holiday time. Um, scouting and greenhouse management and then like pest and soil, soil issues. So it ranges from, you know, if you're a beginner, then you can, you can learn things that are more catered to you and, and it also has like here are all the planting dates that we have, but then also if you were just starting, here's the ones that I would start with. So, um, yeah, can be for beginners or for advanced folks. So, I wish there was something like this when we started. Um, and it just is like all from all the lessons that we've learned through the years, so. Here's a good question. Are you growing anything in crates in the greenhouse? We are growing in crates in the greenhouse. So currently right now we have lilies. So all of our lilies we grow in crates. Um, and that's just because out in the field we had a hard time with moisture management. We would lose them to botrytis or they'd get swallowed by weeds. And so all of our lilies are grown in crates. We plant lilies every two weeks so that way we have lilies throughout the season. Um, lilies are an essential part of our like grocery store bouquets. So. We put a lily in every bouquet. Um, other things that we grow in crates are pre-chilled tulips. So those will plant like, you know, end of the year and then they bloom hmm, like March, March-ish before our outside ones bloom. Um, and we've also done things in crates like freesia, anemones. We haven't had much luck with ranunculus in crates. I think it likes to root deeper than that. Um, but there are a lot of things that you can grow on crates if that's the only space that you have. Um, our issue was just 
making sure that they were getting properly cared for and enough airflow. So we used to do pre-chilled tulips and kind of tuck them into the corners of all the greenhouses. And stuff wouldn't get properly watered, or we'd get botrytis um, from not enough airflow. So now everything in the heated space that's in crates goes into a row, like into a bed, just like other things would, so that way it can be netted and drip tape and that kind of stuff, just so that it's a part of the system. Okay, we have a question about tulips. When is the ideal tulip planting timeline? Do you plant all of your tulips in the tunnel? Favorite tulip planting method? Um, so we do tulips outdoors. And so those we plant beginning of October. And then for us here, we're zone 6A. So they bloom typically April, um, April, and then we can have some into May for Mother's Day. Pre-chilled tulips we plant starting in December and then we do three different successions so because the pre-chilled ones will come on all at once so if you um, are not familiar pre-chilled basically just means that they went through a winter so they're ready to sprout those are the ones that we would put in the greenhouse so if you were planting in a tunnel I would probably buy pre-chilled ones to go in a tunnel just to make sure that they get enough cold to to sprout because if they don't get enough cold if you put them in a tunnel um, and they don't get enough cold, then they won't produce a flower that year. So I know our friends at Urban Buds who are in St. Louis, that they do um, ones in tunnels. They plant theirs in the tunnel and they, they use pre-chilled tulips. So the timing, which might be different for your zone, but for us pre-chilled, we plant um, December, I, and then I think there's two plantings in January. And then that kind of takes us in, they start blooming in March, and then we have those other two successions to sort of bring us into the outdoor tulip planting. Um, favorite varieties. So we try to grow all specialty ones so that they're, they're not singles that florists can get otherwise, just so that you can get like the money that you need for them to make it worth it. Um, Columbus is one of our favorites. Uh, Lavelle is always popular with florists, but sometimes it's hard to get the bulbs as they're in like high demand. Charming Beauty. For parrots, we like um, Professor Rotten Gin, which is a big orange one. Um, apricot Parrot. And then we do grow some of the impressions. Salmon Impression is one of the best sellers, and it's one of the earliest tulips, too. So, like, if you, you know, we try to plant some early, mid, and late, but we focus most of the production on the late blooming ones because those are the ones that we can store and have for Mother's Day. So we pull them up by the bulb, store them in the cooler, which you can store them for up to two weeks. So if we have an earlier tulip season, um, you know, if they're done blooming by end of April, then we can still have tulips for Mother's Day with those later varieties. Okay, back to lilies. What kind of lilies do you grow for cutting and do the bulbs re bloom year after year? So we grow all LA lilies. Um, we get ours from Zabos, but there's multiple other lily growers that you can get bulbs from. Um, we prefer the LA's, that means Longiflorum Asiatic, so it's kind of like a, a hybrid between the two. Asiatics are a little bit smaller, um, and they're the ones that don't smell, but they also, they come in nice colors. The LA's have like a kind of a juicier bud on them and that's why we like them. Um, we plant either the 12 14s or the 14 16s because that's all the bigger that we need them to be for bouquets. Um, if you were selling them by the stem and you wanted a lot more bloom buds per stem then you could get the bigger bulbs but we found we don't really need them to be the bigger ones um, and they do not for us they do not reproduce because we're planting them in crates, planting them every two weeks so that they are timed, so that we have a consistent production, and then they get dumped in the compost. So if you were doing them outside and you were leaving them in the ground, they would all bloom at once in the spring. So you could leave them in the ground and they would produce for you again. But we did that in the beginning, and then you have one flush in June, and then they're all gone. So by doing, doing them as annuals, we're timing them into our schedule um, so that we have a consistent production throughout the season. Um, next question, can cut flower mums be field grown? 
Uh, it would depend on your zone. So for us here, zone 6A, they need to be in a heated space. There are times where unheated works, but they're like this year would not have been one of those years. So if the weather gets cold and cold condensation drips from the plastic in the greenhouse onto the mums, especially because they are kind of like cup shaped, what'll happen is that really cold condensation will damage the petals. So for us, we always put them in the heated space and I'm glad we did because had we not, you know, then this year they wouldn't have made it. And they're typically triggered by, they're triggered by short days. Um, so usually we have more mums blooming. I'm surprised it's end of October. We've really only had Heather James, which is this um, like bronzy one behind me. And then this bed here is like Honey Glow and Miss Goldie. They're spray mums, they're just starting. We only grow, for, as far as percentage goes, you know, these beds are 150 feet long. Um, we only grow one bed of sprays and then the other three beds are disc buds. So the disc buds are, they take more work. You have to kind of, it's just like suckering tomatoes, break off the little side branches so that you get one big fluffy bloom. But for us, those are the ones that we can get the higher dollar value for from the florist. So we try to grow varieties that they wouldn't see at the wholesaler. Um, to give them a reason to buy them from us because some t mums, the standard mums, they can buy for super cheap at the wholesaler. So we want them to all be like fancy, frilly, or like nice colors that they can't get otherwise. Okay, uh, next question. Any tips for stretching out the ranunculus season? Um, yes, you can start them earlier. So for us, that's why we have heated space. So they start blooming. The ones we plant, so week 42 is our first like plant week. And those go in a heated space and those bloom in March for us. So you're not gonna be able to stretch it further into the summer because once it gets hot, they're gonna shut down. So for us, typically, I mean, Mother's Day is like, you know, the focus to get as many as we can in Mother's Day and we can have them in an unheated house for Mother's Day. So that's like, we try to have, you know, one whole house come on basically for the holiday. And then plantings after that, it just sort of depends on how hot we get in May. So I said, like I said, we're zone 6A. There are some springs where we have 90 degree days in May and they sort of shut down in the, that week or so after Mother's Day. So we're lucky to get them to go through the end of May. Um, we have had one year where we had them the first week of June, but they always will get really short and the stems will get really skinny once it gets hot. So um, same thing with anemones, they will like, they'll just shut down once it gets hot. So if you are somewhere in a zone that's warmer than us, it's gonna be hard to get them to go beyond May. Um, so that's why we sort of extend the season the other direction. So by having them starting to bloom in March, then we have them kind of March, April, May. Um, and we have tried also to have them for Valentine's Day. And our problem here is that we still have those 90 degree days in September. So we're too hot, like we get them started and then we plant them in the greenhouse and then they die back because it's too hot in there. So that's the beginning of March has kind of been like the, the best uh, timing that we, we could get just sort of in our experience. But if you have a cooler fall, then you might be able to get them for, for Valentine's Day if you can have them happy in the greenhouse in September. All right, we have some tuber questions. Okay. Um, how do we store tubers for winter? Do we store them in a medium as we divide them? So storage is always a big question for us. You know, every year we learn more about that. Um, and where you store them is kind of just depending on your setup. So we would typically store them in a cooler so they would get dug. We don't wash ours. Um, and that's because we want the root hairs to sort of die back naturally. If you wash them off, then they can sort of get, they can dry out a little bit faster. Sorry, Pinto wants to be involved. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we store them in crates, in those like black bulb crates, 
either in the greenhouse is where we used to store them because that's where we were dividing but we just built a new cooler this year um, that we're putting them in so before they get divided they're not in any kind of medium but once they get divided we pack ours in sawdust so we also use a plastic bag that is perforated that has holes in it so the tricky thing about storage is that you want them to be moist enough that they're not going to dry out but dry enough that they're not going to rot so there's like a fine balance between the two so like you don't want too much airflow because that's going to dry them out but you also don't want them to get like moldy so that's why having the perforated bag in the black crate with the sawdust allows for it to sort of regulate the moisture a little bit um, but we do check on them like throughout the season you know like that's something that I know some people will kind of pack them away and then like not look at them again until spring so like we would definitely suggest if you're gonna put them in the basement or you're gonna put them in the cooler um, or store them so you just want to store them somewhere that's not gonna freeze and you don't want to get too hot so in the green the reason why the greenhouse worked for us is because it was a heated space so it didn't get too cold we're very cloudy in the winter and we also would put a shade cloth over top of them so like they're if you are somewhere where it's sunny a greenhouse might not work because you might get too much heat build up in there um, it just was nice for us to be dividing tubers sitting in the greenhouse so that if it was a sunny day that you could enjoy the sunshine instead of being in a building but this year because we've got that new tuber cooler the plan is probably to divide them in the barn but we did just put in some new led lighting so hopefully it won't feel as dark and gloomy in there in the winter okay um, so next question, how do you store, how long can you store stems and prep for wreath making? Um, so we have, I'm thinking they're talking about dried flowers maybe. That's so, good, let's start there. Yeah. yeah, so it's for dried flower stuff. Um, we can store stuff from the previous year. We had a big learning lesson. If you follow us on social media, um, you know, we just posted about this a couple weeks ago, but what we found is that storing stuff over from year to year can cause some moth problems if it's attract you know attracting to boxes that are open so we what we were doing was just reusing boxes from the wholesaler or just like boxes that we had around um and they weren't completely closed and what that led to was moths being able to like get into the dried flowers and so we had a huge outbreak this summer and um, ended up throwing out about half of our stuff this is the first time in all of our like dried flower history that this has happened um, but in the past we've always had them stored up in the barn up in the rafters which was a lot hotter and like um, more of a closed off environment we just recently built an office building and the upstairs is for dried flowers so everything is open air um, and this was also the first year that we've carried over that much inventory from year to year um, so I would say you know typically what we're doing is we're drying all season long and then we're using that in the fall last year was the first year that we actually had enough inventory to like make wreaths for Valentine's Day or you know have them for sale through the winter um, but so I would just watch your your storage um, situation. So what we determined was we need the boxes to be closed, and then we're using this product called Insect Guard, um, which is what people use for flies, like in a stable. You can get it's a little yellow thing, and we cut it into pieces and put it in the box, and then close the box. So basically, what happens is the moths can moth lay eggs on the crops, like when they're out in the field, and then when they get in the box, they hatch. Um, and so what we want to do is kind of kill, kill those moths off to make sure that everything um, is good and it's not going to give your customers bugs. So, <laughs> What about throwing evergreen stems for wreath making? <laughs> oh, evergreen stems. So we're actually, we'll be getting our evergreen stuff next week. We store it either in the cooler or outside so that it's getting like the moisture from outside. Um, we also will only use stuff that has good needle retention so you have to watch the type of greens that you're using so fir cypress um 
There's one that we really like called Scotch Pine that it looks like pine, but it's really waxy. So ones that don't work well are White Pine, Blue Spruce. They're gonna drop, they're gonna dry out and drop their needles. So you just wanna make sure, um, you know, in the Christmas tree industry, there's a bunch of different kinds, but now that's what they're breeding for is for the fur to like retain those needles and then that lasts the longest. So we do usually tell people, we start selling reeds, the first week we sell reeds is the Saturday before Thanksgiving. So we do usually tell people, you know, if you put it in your house and it's pretty dry, you might need to like spritz it or something. But usually if it's outside, like on a door that is getting the humidity from the moisture outside, um, then they're fine like through, through the holidays. So um, we'll be getting our greens starting next week and they'll go into a cooler. Okay, next question. I struggle with fall direct sewing. Any tips for success? <clears throat> um, yes, you probably need to do it maybe sooner than what you think. So like for us, we direct seed Larkspur in August. Um, so with the idea being that like you want some stuff to sprout before the going into the cold winter. So that way like they're little plants. Um, so I think August... 20th or so is typically when we we seed larkspur nigella um we do we used to do cornflower we have problems in may with thrips happening um so we don't do as much of the overwintered for spring bloom stuff for that reason um you can also transplant out like Rebecca and Yarrow, you know, Lisa, we're on the gardener's workshop right now. So like Lisa has a good book called cool flowers that she talks a lot about that, the different like options. But, um, I think getting it in and getting it established before going into winter. And even if you have a really cold winter, there was a couple years ago, we had a really cold winter, but we had enough snow cover and it was the best even though it was really cold, it was the best spring crop that we had of nigella, um, bupleurum, some of those other things that you can fall seed for spring bloom. Okay, um, let's see. There is Sunflower Sky Farm is going to build a metal flower building with a cooler for holding and processing flowers. What size is your building and is it insulated? Yes, our building is insulated. We have um, the flower processing barn is 40 by 40. And the cooler that we had originally off the back was uh, 12 by 20, 14 by 20. I think it was supposed to be 14, but they built it smaller than they were supposed to. Um, and then the, the cooler that we just built for tubers is also this like 40 by 40. So like it's, it's really big, but that's because we're storing Right now we have 26 pallets of tubers and they're still bringing them in out of the field. So we got a lot of tubers to store. Um, but yes, I think however big you can build it, you will grow into it. So that's something we call it the cooler effect. Like if you build it, we will fill it basically. So like we have that cooler off of the flower processing barn. We have a reefer trailer that we use, um, which is another option. Like if you don't have the ability to like build a cooler um, we started out with just like a little seven up cooler but you know that we you know we quickly outgrew that and then we also framed in a cooler into our two car garage um, and I think that is whatever half of a two car garage that was our original original cooler space so I think you know just building with expansion in mind this office building that we just built was the first first barn that we actually built like with the idea of sort of being able to grow into it and we're already we've been in it for a year and a half and we're already utilizing all the space in there so <sighs> build it as big as you can okay uh good greenhouse question how do you deal with thrips and other pests <clears throat> so that is a really good question so we spend a whole week on this in our class but I can talk briefly about it so we do a lot of scouting, especially in the greenhouses where we go through weekly and look at all the crops. Um, so, you know, it also is just based off of information that we've gathered. 
of like when the time is that we typically have the flush of thrips or what is the pest that usually affects like this specific crop. So you know like chrysanthemums get a, an aphid, cabbage gets an aphid, the lizzies ha like get a different aphid. So it's like just sort of knowing that information and having that then we know what we're looking for when we're going in there. Um, so every week we have somebody walk through or when they're harvesting, they're also scouting too, to like give us an idea, you know, once it's a busy part of the season, we don't always have time for somebody to walk through and look at like every bed and every greenhouse. But especially in the winter, because the greenhouse is closed up, um, you know, the pests move in and because we're so cloudy, the diseases happen because there's not that much airflow or um, like the plants aren't using that much moisture so we have condensation and humidity build up in the greenhouse um, so for thrips specifically we use a mite called cucumerous mite so we, use, we have an integrated pest management plan so based on what we know what pests we get then we try to be proactive with that with beneficial insects so the cucumerous mites um, help to build up in the greenhouse so that they're you're doing a preventative measure they eat the pupa of the thrips so they're not going to come in and like get rid of it once you have it but by applying the mites you're sort of like preempting that you want to get to you want to get to things we have things on a scale of of zero to five so if you know if it is something that is two or three then it's something that needs to be addressed so you want things, you want to take care of things before they get to the extreme. And I think, you know, that's something when we first started that we didn't really know. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, we were throwing out half of the anemones because the aphids were so bad on them that we you have to go in and sort of do something reactive. Um, but we do also have like an, an arsenal of different products that we use based on the type of pest and, um, we're not certified organic, but we try and do things as sustainably as possible or use things that, you know, work well with beneficials since we do use beneficials in the greenhouse. We don't want to spend the money to apply them and then come in with the product behind that that's going to kill them all. So we want to make sure that it is, you know, that everything is working together as a part of a like integrated system. Okay, last question. When direct sowing, how do you keep weeds at bay? Mulch? And if so, with what? So when we're direct sowing, the biggest thing is bed prep. So we go through a month before we know we need to plant in that bed and do the initial tilling. And then two weeks before we would go through and either shallow till or if it's in the greenhouse or somewhere where we're not using a tractor, use like a hoe or a rake or something to just break the soil surface and to kill the weed seeds. So you want to get weeds when they're tiny tiny like before they're a big issue so like as the weed seeds germinate the white thread stage is when you want to kill weeds so if you can set yourself up for success by allowing yourself time to prep the bed it's tilling initially and then we would do some kind of shallow till two weeks out and then sometime some kind of shallow till like right before we plant into them um using like we use a four row cedar. So we had an earthway originally that we like put four of them together and we would sew the bed. So that way it's a straight line and you can hoe in between. So the more, if you do cover it, direct seeding this is one of the hardest things is the weed control. If you do cover it, then that means you have to hand weed. So for us, we choose to use a hoe and mechanical cultivation um, instead of using plastic or using mulches like within our bed system. So we'll mulch in the beds in between, in the greenhouses, like in the, in the walkways, but we don't put anything down actually in the beds. Okay, and last question. Can we still sign up for your class? <laughs> yes, definitely. So the class, the registration goes live November 19th and it's live for five days. So it's kind of like a limited availability thing. Um, so we'll be on the gardener's workshop and also talking about it on Sunny Meadows Flower Farms, like social media and stuff as we get closer to time. Um, so November is a big month for us. We launch our Dahlia tubers November 18th. 
So if you're looking for dahlias to purchase, that's the day Friday, and then the following day, Saturday the 19th, is when the class launches. Um, so the class starts in January, it's six weeks long. Each week you get the next week sort of released to you, and then there's a live Q&A session each week to sort of have that interaction with the students um, so that you can watch all the videos and you also get, you know, all of our past Q&A sessions and any like bonus footage and then um, you have access to it for life too. So that's something that like if you get overwhelmed because it is a lot of information and then you can sort of, you know, take your time to process it and then sort of come back to it. So you have the ability to like have it as a reference. So if you know, sometimes when we get to the week that's about pests and diseases, people get kind of disheartened because they're, we're talking about all the issues that we've ever had, but it's really just so that you have that as a reference so that when you do experience something like that, then you can come back to it and say, oh, well, they talked about, you know, they talked about thrips in the class, like what, you know, be able to like go, go back to it and reference it again. So. Cool. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we're excited to have all of you here and we will be back talking with Lisa. I think we've got a couple webinars and things like that scheduled. So we'll be sure to announce if you follow Sunny Meadows Flower Farm. We also have a newsletter that goes out weekly that keeps everybody updated with the calendar of what's going on um, and to keep in touch. So thanks for joining us.